So welcome everybody. Um, this is a presentation of ING. Uh, the video you just saw is the video that we shot at the last year's hackathon. It also shows that we as a bank are, are trying to adopt more and more the engineering culture that we see around us and we really like that. That's also why Gary and I really love working at ING. And just to give you a, a quick recap of what ING is all about. ING, we are a bank. We are a bank since 1917, and we are the biggest bank in the Netherlands, or Holland, I believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we are the 25th biggest bank in the world, so we are a, pretty much a player in there. And uh, we did our very first digital payment in 1986. We were the very first bank in the Netherlands even that was making this digital payment. And so you can see we are pretty much the front runners there on technology in the Netherlands for banking. And we still are. And uh, we kept on being it. But at the part of uh, actually the, the mobile devices, we laid low a little bit. Uh, but we're now the best uh, mobile banking app in the Netherlands. So we're really proud of that. And it shows that we as a bank are still really adopting this engineering culture, and that's why Gary and I really love working there. As said, my name is Chris Redijk. I work for four years now at ING, and I have an experience of around 10 years in IT, mainly on BPM and integration, so that's the, the back-end or slash middle-end part of the IT, and that's also why I really like working with Cassandra. It's the new thing, it's distributed, it's cool, nice to work with, and. Uh, that's actually where I, meet, uh, where I met Gary, so. Hi, my name is uh, Gary Stewart. I uh, have a little bit less uh, experience in ING, but uh, I do make up for that in uh, IT experience. Um, like Chris, I'm also uh, in integration and uh, business uh, processing is my uh, background. But I also have a strong uh, database uh, experience, uh, SQL, which is why I tend to have a love-hate relationship with uh, Cassandra, because I feel like I'm missing all those features. Funny thing is, a year ago when we started on this, uh, we knew nothing about Cassandra. We pretty much, Cassandra who? Um, it was really uh, quite challenging for us, and to be standing up here within a year is, is quite an honor. Um, just to show you us getting out of our comfort zone, we made this presentation in uh, JavaScript and HTML, so for back-end guys, I think this is pretty cool. Um, but we hope you enjoy it. Just to uh, iterate on what uh, Chris was saying about the last 100 years, Actually, the last three years is more interesting, um, or last two to three years. If you have a look at what's happening, is the rate of change in a bank is changing fast. And if you have a look at the previous 100 years, it wasn't actually that big of an issue. But what does this mean? Uh, I mean, it's great to have all these new front-end uh, devices, all these new ways of interacting. But for the back-end, this is a challenge, because we are not able to cope with all these new access patterns. And that means that we need to do something about it. And unfortunately, we've been in the news for unavailability, um, and we take that personally. It's, you know, it affects our customers. So we really need to look into alternative ways of improving scalability and resilience in our solution. So actually, what I forgot to mention in the last slide is that uh, what our title <laughs> is all about. So we're testing the waters, consistency required. And as you might expect, for a bank, it's very important to be consistent in certain parts of the organization or in the processes. Yep. So that's also why we really want to focus on this in this presentation on how we achieved consistency and how we uh, convinced our CIOs to uh, have faith in, in Cassandra and to use it in the more critical processes as well. Um, so, but before we are showing you that, I just want to recap quickly what Gary was stating. Uh, what we are seeing as challenges at this moment of time. So we really need to be easier scalable. I, I saw Billy Bosworth this morning, also Jonathan, they were talking about a lot about uh, the world is changing around us, right? So new devices are coming up and we really have to uh, more or less expect the unexpected, so the unexpected load. So we should be able to be coping with that. And with the current setup that we have at ING, uh, that will not be able. We have sort of less reached the max of our scalability and therefore, we really need to find something that could help us to be easier and better scalable than we are now. Next to that, it was very important to remove any single point of failure. Because if you think about it, uh, if you are going to be easier scalable, you will have more machines. So you have to be sure that uh, we don't introduce any single point of failure while we're at it. Indeed. 
And of course, as said, we will not trade on consistency, especially not with those parts of our processes where consistency is required. And the other next uh, nice challenge that we got from our CIO is what that we had to be active active. They didn't want an active passive setup because we have that nowadays. So we have a DR and disaster recovery, but they really stated, okay, if we're going to do this, if we're going to change either way, then also change it to be active active. That actually turned out to be quite the challenge for us at ING. Indeed. So how did we do that? We did it with distributed systems. It's a pretty common concept, but we were not doing that in the ING as of yet. So we see a lot of big companies out there, engineering com companies uh, with high availability and high scalability, which are using dissipated systems, but we as a bank were still not using it. So why not? That was actually the question. And we also thought, why not? So therefore we actually said we should be using this distributed systems and being backend guys, we wanted to focus on the Cassandra part or actually the database part. And then of course some players come in mind and for us I, eventually, the, cho the choice was to have Cassandra. And why? Uh, we really love the fact that it's as flexible as it is. So we really love the fact that it's a common family store and it's uh, a tunable consistency. That's one of the most important facts that we had for, uh, for, an, uh, uh, for Cassandra because we really like the fact that you have more flexibility on your data model using a column family than when you have a key value store. And of course, the tunable consistency helps us to achieve more use cases than, um, uh, than just one single use case that you can achieve with the other ones. We really love the fact that it's a very big, active, open source community, uh, which is behind the Cassandra. So that's really helping us to have more and more faith and see a lot of development in this product as well. So really love you guys, all of you who are working on it. Thanks a lot, uh, it's really appreciated. And of course, we also like the CQL3 uh, part. It, it reminds of, uh, us of, of SQL cool. in that sense. But the most important part here, and that's also what Gary's going to talk about is, it has also active active support out of the box. So that really helped us in, in that part. Indeed, um, you know, active active, it's quite an important uh, aspect for the solution. But if you take a step back and uh, you know, we have a look at what we're doing today, uh, quite often you, you will have a single instance database with synchronous or asynchronous replication. Synchronous replication gives you the strongest consistency, but it also maximizes your single points of failure. And for your writes, you also have the most latency. And generally speaking, the first step you'll do is you will decrease the synchronous to asynchronous, and thereby you're giving up a little bit of consistency in a resilience scenario, um, but you've decreased the single points of failure. If we were to try and reproduce the same thing in Cassandra, we um, basically see that you can actually do it. You could go for uh, write on each quorum, and you can do a read on local quorum. In the situation, you reduce the single points of failure because now you have a tolerance for uh, your nodes dying, but you still have the link uh, as a single point of failure. The consistency we've marked as less consistent than a relational da uh, transactional database or a single instance database, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute. And of course, if you want to do asynchronous, then you can also choose to do each quorum, sorry, local quorum for your reads and writes. And then you could choose one as an active and one as a passive, or you can uh, use both. But then the consistency goes down one level, which we'll get into uh, in a minute. If you have a look what the main difference is between the two, you'll see that there's a single instance versus five or 10 machines. And the first thing that came to my mind was, what if the times on those machines are different? How would that impact you? It can impact you. And actually, we did a lot of proof of concepts at ING, and one of the things we experienced during these proof of concept is uh, we were putting a lot of load on the system, but we also have NTP, so net time protocol, of course, in our data centers, which should keep our systems in sync. But what we did see is that if one of the nodes is in the future, uh, it, in this case, it's the, the, the left one, the one with the red clock, let's say that one lives in the future, it could be that if you do two inserts within milliseconds after each other, that actually the, the latest insert is not seen as the latest insert for Cassandra. And what happens then, if you do a, a select on, on your data, it could retrieve the wrong data. In this sense, it could uh, return you new uh, instead of open. And if it does, it would mean that we might make wrong decisions based on that data that we're getting back. It, it's 
like an open door, but it did happen for us. And that's why we said, okay, for us, if you want to be consistent, we really have to be careful with time in everywhere. So what did we do? Uh, we said to ourselves, uh, how can we solve this? And we say, okay, maybe it's best to have an append-only model. And append-only model really helps us, especially uh, if you are idempotent. And Gary very well <laughs> describes how okay. idempotency works. Uh, uh, very simple. Um, if you do the same action repeatedly, uh, you will have no change on the data. So if you insert into the database the same statement multiple times, there will be no net change on that data. So it's essentially retriable. Yes. So that's very good, and, it, and we will come back on the out and potent part later on. That's why it's important that everybody's on one page on that one. Uh, but even in an append-only model, it could be that you have some times in there, right? Uh, we had some examples for us where we wanted to store states, and we wanted to retrieve the latest state for a message or a transaction or an order for that fact. So it could happen that uh, I wanted to insert multiple states and then say, okay, what is my latest state? But if I were using time, to make that decision to determine which was my latest state, it could go wrong. However, we came up, or we came up, the internet came up, and very smart people came up with a finite state machine, uh, which we used. And uh, for our example, we used the Floyd Warshall algorithm for the people who are interested. Uh, and what the finite state machine actually does, it determines the states and the transitions. Actually, those, this is configured up front. And while you're going through your application and through your states, uh, it's using a calculation to make sure that you can uh, detect what your final state or final state will be, or what your next state will be. So if you are trying to make a transition from a state to another state, which is not allowed, it will say to you, it's not allowed. It will return an error. And therefore, you also know that the latest state that you are trying to achieve was not a valid state, and therefore, uh, it helps us in retrieving the latest state from Cassandra and using the latest state. And if we did not get the latest state, uh, we could reconciliate there where needed. Yeah. So essentially, we're ignoring time in our states. Yeah. Perfect. We also um, did say that we wanted a solution without any single points of failure. And this was also a bit of a challenge because when we first started, we, you know, we ordered 10 nodes and we were going to do five in each data center. But then, of course, Cassandra forces you to think about it. It forces you to actually look at all the resilience scenarios and see what's happening. And if you have a look at it, um, if you were to do for the consistency part, you would have quorum. Now, quorum means that the single point of failure will be the link between the two data centers. So that is, again, not a, you know, we still have a single point of failure in the solution. We could go for the um, local quorum, but then you run the risk of split brain. Um, split brain is where you have one data center knowing a piece of data and the other data center knowing another piece of data. And if you're making decisions on this data, you essentially don't know about each other. And we take this quite seriously because if you were doing transactions or orders, sometimes it could be one euro and sometimes it could be a million euros. So depending on the situation, you really do have to think about what the consequences are. To solve this, um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. One is building with split brain in mind. So essentially, you are putting in uh, data center stickiness on the data. So when an order comes in, you can actually tag it and say, this order arrived in data center one or Amsterdam. And then you can say, anything that happens on this order should happen in that data center. Downside of this solution is that it is not really full uh, tolerance to failure, because if the order comes in a different data center and the link is down, you won't be able to process it. The other downside is there's a lot of application logic uh, and a lot of routing, and yeah. We chose not to go down that path. Of course, we did go down the expensive path, and that was the three data center solution, where you make sure you have three links between each data center. And this was fine for us, um, but the problem here was that we had 10 nodes, so we then changed it from uh, five, five to three, three, three. And that also meant that we needed to increase our replication factor. So we were a bit uh, worried about this because we were worried that we are not going to be testing our uh, model against hotspots because essentially we have the same number of replication factor as um, nodes. But in our situation, it turned out to be a very interesting uh, thing because what we found out was that if you have your 
data centers set up the way you want, that means you've got your latency between the data centers, you can actually um, test easier, by, and you can tune the cluster easier. So because every time you do something on the cluster, you're going to feel all the bumps. And if all your nodes are the same, then if you're writing on Quorum, actually all nine nodes are the same. So it actually proves that Cassandra's eventual consistency is pretty much alive and kicking. But the nice thing is if you make a, uh, a tweak, then you can test it again, and you will see the impact immediately, and then you can scale out. So this is an easier way to find uh, the optimal settings for your node. The other funny uh, thing we found is that if you're using batches, so the Cassandra batches, you need two, uh, two nodes per data center to satisfy that batch. It's an undocumented feature. Uh, so what that means is that if you think you have a tolerance of failure of four nodes, actually you only have one per data center in our situation, but because we're planning to go live with a larger cluster, we, uh, we're not too worried about this issue. But the most important thing that we found out was that it helps with corner situations. So if you want to test for resilience uh, scenarios, the easiest thing is you want to do is you want to increase the load, you want to uh, increase the which will in result increase the latency, and it's at that moment you want to start killing stuff, because there you will find all the corner situations. And we do have a confession to make. We didn't know about it. Actually, Hayato is sitting over there. He uh, told us about this uh, issue, and we brushed it off and thought, nah, it's not going to affect us. Of course not, but it <laughs> did, uh, and it was painful. Um, and it, we're talking about post-observable behavior. And just to make sure uh, and paint a picture what post-observable behavior is, how we explain it, it's just an example, so don't be too tough on us with this example. <laughs> but it is an example of how you could see post-observable behavior in Cassandra. And uh, what it actually means, you have some operations, right? You're just inserting data or updating data or whatever you're doing. But you're doing the normal work that you normally do with Cassandra. Imagine that while you're doing that, your coordinator dies. So you already told your other nodes that they should be writing the data. Uh, they are acknowledging the fact that they're writing the data. But your client actually got a timeout. So the client might think it did not work out. So uh, if you go to Cassandra again, and you're trying to get your state back in this sense, it might be that you get an open state back where you might have expected new because that very first state was new uh, and it actually failed. So for us, what we learned from this and uh, how we had to change our application as well is that the only truth is success. So everything else, so an error or a timeout could just be a maybe. So we really had to make sure that um, uh, that we could work around this issue if it happens. And it did happen for us. Yep. Uh, and it, it, it has some weird um, behaviors if it happens in, in a high load situation that we had. So how did we fix this? Uh, it would have been fixed if we were completely idempotent. So if you're completely idempotent in your data model, you could just do a retry, right? So that's easy. So because then everything you were missing in the first try uh, would be done and you would not have impact on any other of the stuff that you were, have done before. However, we have parts in our application which are not idempotent. Yep. And may, most likely most of the applications have those critical paths. We call them critical paths now. And what we do, uh, we are introducing our finite stake machine again to make sure that when we have a critical path, uh, that, that it helps us to identify if post-observing behavior might have happened. And how do we do that? We are, uh, as I said, we identify the critical path, and before we start with this critical path, we insert the technical state. So that means that's still idempotent, that part. Uh, and when uh, it's going into the critical path, which is not idempotent, at the end it should set the official state, let's say open or new, which we have discussed before. If uh, something dies, and I have to retry, and I'm going to try to do a retry on my stuff. It just goes around and it goes in to that state again and then my finite state machine actually retrieves the technical state. Meaning, ah, something happened here in your critical path and you have to fix this. Either you do it automat automatically or you have to do some manual intervention to solve the stuff that was not properly handled in that non-item potent part. So there's your reconciliation path that you really need to uh, walk. And if it would have retrieved the correct state, of course, the open state or the new state, 
it would have skipped that non-item potent part because you don't want to uh, uh, go through that part again because it is not item potent. So it could change the outcome that you didn't want it to change. So that's post-observable behavior for us and this is also how we think we solved it or we believe we solved it and then we also saw that it worked in our resilience testing that we have done. Uh, before this, fi this fix, it didn't work. Uh, we had some issues and after this fix, we could already upfront uh, make sure that we saw which uh, messages were in a reconciliation state. So that's very nice to see. However, we had spoken about three issues now or findings to say it like that. But we also have a next subject and that's a pretty big one. It's about synchronization. And why synchronization? Because we are a bank. Fine, actually. So we still have batching. And I'm not talking about the Cassandra batch, I'm talking about batch files. So that means that we still have batch files going out to external systems to process data. But since we're now distributed and we're getting a lot of messages in, in, in our systems which are being handled by a lot of machines, we don't have full control over what goes where uh, until you have a synchronization point. So that's why we introduced synchronization mm -hmm. and uh, Gary's going okay. to tell you all about it. What do we do today um, just to maybe make a technical solution of the uh, synchronization? In a transactional database, you would have a uh, begin transaction. So essentially you're getting a, uh, a lock. You would um, then write a query select for update. So what does that mean? It means give me a bunch of data and for all the rows that I retrieve back, put a lock. Nobody else is allowed to read this data. And then you would, uh, you can also use with no wait, so that is if two people try to get it at the same time or two queries, then one will just go out and say uh, nothing found. Then you would do your work and then you would uh, so send the file out and then you would uh, commit the changes. So what does that mean? It's actually a synchronized point. So as we're inserting into a table, we're actually using a transaction, we're using the select for update to get the data and then we're within that transaction, we're sending the file out. The problem with this solution is that there's no resilience. Um, so when something goes wrong, you have to restart. The risk of deadlocks, um, so the scalability of this is also a problem. The other problem is, if we were to try and do this in Cassandra, it doesn't really work, because Cassandra doesn't have any of these features. You can't do begin train, you can't do for, uh, for update. Um, so Having a look at Cassandra is not really the right way to do it. There is lightweight transactions, um, but it's actually more compare and set. So you wouldn't use a compare and set for this uh, use case. Yeah. So we introduced an analogy um, to help us because we needed to solve this problem another way around. And we used analogy train management. Um, basically, uh, this analogy helped us explain it to uh, management, um, so that's why we use it. Sometimes it's a bit confusing, but we'll see if we can get through this. Um, a train is a file. The file is an outgoing file, so that's where all the um, messages will end up on. And a train will then go to a destination, so that will be the receiving application. So you can think of uh, B2B, business to business application, or wherever that file needs to go. And then a passenger will be the message, and a message could be a transaction, it could be an order, and we're collecting them all together. And then, of course, to uh, chunk it up, we have carriages. So a passenger will board a carriage, and then the carriage will be attached to the train. So this is how we broke the problem up into chunks. Yeah, and just to make sure that we're all on one page, because, as said, we sometimes lose people when we introduce a train analogy. Uh, just a quick sum up, or a legend, uh, if you want to call it, uh, what is what? So the train is the file, so that's what uh, Gary already addressed, and of course a train normally has multiple carriages attached to it. So those, uh, those carriages are a chunk of the file, and all those chunks of a file together will make the in, in end file that we want to send out to the destination, which is the receiving application. Uh, but we only will have any information in that file if we have passengers. So that's where the passenger comes from. A passenger is each message in the file, so each line in the file that is in the carriage. So that's actually the whole analogy. And I, it's pretty important that, that we're all on one page here because yeah. he's going to mention those a lot. So um, actually, let's break the problem back up uh, a little bit. If you have a look, we have an application that owns a carriage. Now, an application can own multiple carriages, but a carriage is only owned by one application. So that means that I can add passengers to the carriage without having to do a read before my write. 
So this is one of the nice advantages. And I can also see the carriage as a petition. So basically, I'm owning the petition in the application, and I'm also not doing read before my write. So that gives me a higher throughput. The downside is that I need a counter, not a Cassandra counter, but just a counter in the application itself. So there is a little bit of state in the application, keeping track of the carriage size. What we did in our first version uh, was we had a synchronized point in the application because uh, we needed to know the last passenger on the carriage because we wanted that thread, and I'll get to that reason in a minute. So what we actually noticed in this solution was that because we needed to be active-active, this is one of the other challenges of active-active, you have cross data center latency. So that meant that actually by putting the synchronization in the application, we reduced our throughput uh, by the, the latency of the data center. And in our case, it was between five and 10 milliseconds. So we could get maximum, say, 200 per second, which is not a good number. So what we then did was we decided, okay, we have to do something else. We have to get rid of that synchronization. And then we introduced something called post-counter counters. So what does that mean? It means that I count before I send it, and I also count after I receive the response, because I want to know the last thread. And the problem with distributed systems is that when you send multiple things in parallel, you can't be guaranteed that they'll come back in the same order you send them out. So we ended up having a second counter to keep track for that thread. The reason why we need to have the last passenger is because we want to attach that carriage to the train. Now, you could go through the other solution, and that is polling on the database for full carriages. But for us, we wanted to continue with that thread and then get a lock. We'll get to the lock in a minute. Uh, Chris will explain that. But essentially, the lock just ensures that nobody else is working on that train. And then I can attach the carriage to the train. And I'm still having that thread. So now I have all the train information in my application. So I can see, hey, is the train full? If the train is full, then I can also get another lock on the destination, and then I can actually depart the train. In other words, make up the file and send the file out. So what, I've actually, what we've actually done is we basically are masterless in our batching out. We're using the thread to continue to sending the file out. And putting it all together, you can see multiple applications with multiple threads filling up their own partition, and then getting a lock to attach it to the train, and then when the train's full, sending it out. So of course, you do need to add the extra steps like maintenance and depots, and just to make sure that everything is smooth running. Because in our use case, what we did was, when an uh, application crashes, we never got a uh, carriage again. We just started a new one. So we left half full carriages. So there are some you know, extra logic that you need to do to tie all the pieces together. But the reason why we're doing all this is because if we were to use Paxos for every single passenger, we wouldn't be able to get the performance. So this way, we actually reduced the use of Paxos limited. And Chris is going to get into the locking. Yeah, because we still need Paxos, right? Uh, it's a very cool feature of 2.0. We're very happy to have it. And we're also using it for those locking moments. And we call them uh, cluster locks. Uh, but uh, I got corrected on this a couple of times uh, because cluster lock sounds a bit like uh, heavy. Uh, but we just want to make sure that, uh, that you know about uh, the fact that it's cluster wide, that only one thread is working on that single train or that single destination which Gary was referring to. So it's not like we're freezing all the machines just to do some work. We're just making sure that there's sort of a mutex lock on that process, to say it like that which means that we need a couple of functions to make this work. And we introduced three functions for that. Actually, it's acquire, refresh, and release. And as you can see, the refresh can happen multiple times. So what is the acquire? The acquire is, of course, getting the lock. So I need to get a lock. And in order to do that, I'm using, as said, a lightweight transaction. So if not exist, using TTL as well. So actually, what this says is I'm inserting a lock into the cluster lock table but I will only insert it if the train ID or that destination ID is not yet uh, in the table. If it is, I cannot get the lock and I have to wait to get this lock uh, until it is released. So we also introduced a TTL. And why did we introduce a TTL? 
uh, we introduced TTL because we didn't want uh, endless locking from one thread, right? So if uh, for some reason the thread is hanging or there's something going wrong with the application, we want to make sure that at the Cassandra side, at least the lock is released by uh, actually deleting the lock from the table. But that also implies that you need to refresh your lock if you take more time than the TTL which you have specified up front, of course. So that's why we have this refresh function. It's not, not nothing more than just increasing your TTL again. So make sure that you have more time to do processing on that specific thread or a specific application or your train or destination. And once you're done, finally, you can do a release of your lock. And of course, you want to release it as soon as possible because every time or every millisecond counts in this solution because you want to have high throughput. So uh, as soon as we can release this lock so that another application or thread can pick up uh, the train or the destination, uh, we want to release it as soon as possible. So that's, in short, how the cluster lock works for us. And it works actually very good. And we're using Paxos for that, so the lightweight transactions of Cassandra itself. And we use that, uh, according to the documentation, it said for less than 1% of the application. Because of the train management analogy, we managed to achieve less than 0.001% of the application. Yeah. So, because it's depending on the carriage size. Yeah, so that's yeah. good. We're following the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just a quick recap on what we just uh, uh, gone through. So there were four concepts. Uh, the first one was time, right? So uh, bear in mind that time can have impact. So if you have any decision making in your application, which you will have, try to avoid time. That's our uh, uh, advice in that. And, and one of the, of the ways of doing that, especially if you're using states, could be that finite state machine that we were talking about, right? Of course, we had that split brain. Uh, so you can have a split brain if you have two data centers. And uh, you, if you don't want to have a single point of failure, we introduce the third data center, or you can introduce DC stickiness so that you stick to your data center, which makes you a little bit less available, but it still works, of course. Then we had the post-observable behavior, and this post-observable behavior, we fix it with a finite state machine or with an append-only model, or at least an idempotent model, sorry about that. And uh, last but not least is the train management. That's our way of solving synchronization using Cassandra in a distributed way and having a masterless distributed solution for your synchronization, which really works well for us. Indeed. And um, you know, when we put this all together, um, we feel like we've increased uh, or um, kept the level of consistency that we need, because for us, consistency is trust to our customers. Um, but we didn't trade too much on the Cassandra's scalability and availability benefits. So all combined, we feel like we've got a masterless solution in our own uh, applications, and we're also not limiting Cassandra by building on top of uh, the application. So that's always a risk. You have to look at your own application and make sure you don't add bottlenecks or um, inconsistencies because of the way your data flows. And um, you may all be wondering uh, what our use case is that we are. Um, we don't really want to sort of say yet what it is uh, because we're not in production. Um, but we will be uh, letting you know as we go down this path. But we are picking up the critical processes. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting time for us at ING. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.